All right, there we go. So it is two um, and we will get started. Let me just close out my email here. Okay, and pull up the PowerPoint. So continuing from Wednesday, uh, what we're going to talk about today is evolution in terms of proteins, right? And so we left off on uh, this first question. I did it at the very end, um, but I'll just recap. Um, so we're looking at mutations, and we have this idea of conservative mutations, right? And so we talked about three types of mutations we can see in proteins when it comes to amino acid, right? So a conservative just means has the same properties. So for valine, it's a conservative mutation would be any amino acid that's also nonpolar because valine is nonpolar. So you have your alanine, your leucine, and your isoleucine. Arginine is positively charged. And so lysine would be a conservative mutation. And lastly, uh, C, I said this super fast, so I'll just say it again. Uh, Gly is often substituted for Val, but we can't really substitute uh, Val for glycine. Why? And that has to do with steric hindrance. So in a protein, atoms are usually packed very close together for the most part. There's some wiggle room in there and it depends what part of the protein you're talking about. But usually um, proteins are, are just, the atoms and proteins are close together. So if I have glycine and this line I drew is the other part of my protein, if I try to replace that glycine with valine, which has the side chain that looks like this, I can't really fit valine into that pocket where glycine is. Um, the protein would have to change. The protein wouldn't be able to fold correctly. And if the protein can't fold correctly into a 3D shape, the protein won't work. While going the other way around, if this is my valine, right? And I want to put glycine in there, that's no problem because there's plenty of space. So for C, we're talking about steric, steric hindrances. Shrinking an amino acid side chain is usually no problem. Uh, growing a side chain through a mutation can be a problem. All right, so that's where we left off on Wednesday. Um, here I have a, a little bit more practice. So let's let's just begin here and see by looking at our amino acids, which positions are invariable? Which positions will not tolerate mutations? Which positions whoops, can tolerate conservative mutations or substitutions? And what positions are highly variable? So this is just a way to check our vocab and if we understand that. So let's see if we can figure this out for one through 10. So uh, for A, B, and C, uh, for the numbers one through 10, assign them a letter, either A for unable to tolerate substitutions, B can tolerate conservative, C just super highly variable.
Well, let's just start to look at uh, some of these. Right? So um, as I mentioned before, it is important that we know uh, our amino acids. It's important that just by saying the one letter code, we can start to picture what the side chain looks like. That's why we did all this training, so I, we can do exercises like these. So one, we have aspartic acid and glutamic acid, D and E. Um, those are both negative. So this would be a conservative uh, substitution. You can substitute it as long as it's negative. Uh, two, it's the same idea. Everything here is more or less hydrophobic, I, I, L, L, Y, and F. So two does also have some uh, conservative substitution. It really doesn't matter what's there as long as it's hydrophobic. Three, we have some hydrophobic residues. We have some polar residues. We have something that's negatively charged. So three, we're all over the place with the different amino acids. So it really doesn't matter what's there. It just matters that an amino acid is there by the looks of it. So this area is highly variable. Uh, same thing with four. All over, you got negative charge, you got hydrophobic, a little bit of polar with T. So that's all over the place. Five. Um, so five is interesting, um, and this goes into some of our talks about uh, amino acids and pH. If you selected C for five, I would not fault you for that. I could definitely see the argument because I told you that histidine is one of our positive amino acids. Now, that's how we learn it. So let's actually talk a little bit more about histidine. Histidine has a pKa of the side chain at six. Now, at a neutral pH of seven, which we care about, what this means is that 70% of histidine is not charged while 30% of histidine is charged, is positively charged. That's roughly what the ratios are inside of the cell when you talk about histidine. So histidine is mostly uncharged at seven, but it can also be somewhat positive. So it's, it's hard to say by just looking at the amino acid H at, with just looking at the primary structure, and again, primary structure equals order of amino acids. You cannot tell if this histidine will be charged or neutral. You really need to um, understand the local environment it's in. That is what's surrounding it. You can give a better indication if it'll be charged or neutral based on that. So you could say C here. You can also say B conservative because um, they're gonna be at least all polar, right? So I would accept like C or B for that. Um, six. A, always glycine. That tells you that glycine is critical at that position. No other amino acid works. Um, seven, we got uh, C. So we got um, like polar, charge polar, small, not, not like just a hydrogen for a side chain. So again, I would say that's all over the place for me. Uh, eight, um, so eight, I said was, oh, so eight is C. That's why it doesn't make sense. Because you have a nonpolar and then you have a negatively charged. I think the first time I read this, I thought that said uh, uh, K, but it says L. Nine, doesn't change. Uh, 10, conservative. So that's the way I scored it. Um, for C and like when you're deciding between C and B, as we saw for five, there is some wiggle room. So it depends on how you want to argue it. But A, like uh, uh, unable tolerance uh, substitution, that's always obvious. And conservative is usually obvious with some fringe cases that we talked about. Why column B isn't variable? Um, what do you mean by column B? Do you mean column two? Um, because the B just means conservative. 
So why isn't two highly variable? Um, because nonpolar, 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 nonpolar. Um, even though you're making um, aromatics versus aliphatics, um, so aromatic, if you remember, has the ring, aliphatics, it's just carbon and hydrogens, they're still nonpolar. So I would, um, I would make the argument that everything's nonpolar. So that's why it's conservative. Eight um, is not conservative because you have negative, 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 nonpolar, negative. So if we're just going on this alone, this data alone, we have shown that position eight does tolerate a substitution. And it's it's a nonpolar sub. It's a yeah, it's a nonpolar substitution while everything else is negative, which starts to argue for it doesn't actually matter that a negative amino acid's there. We would need to see more organisms if if they, we saw like 60 organisms and everything was an E except one position, um, then maybe you could make the argument that it, it is pretty intolerant and maybe that L that's there is due to another mutation in the protein that's interacting with that L in ways we can't understand right now. But just by going on that, I would say that's why it's uh, highly variable. Right. So hopefully now that we understand what, um, you know, invariable, conservative, and highly variable means for in terms of uh, protein and amino acid uh, evolution. And the cool thing about doing those type of comparisons, you can look at homologous proteins, look at the amino acid sequences, and just compare how alike the amino acid sequences are, and you can make a flat phylogenetic tree out of that, just by looking at proteins. And that's what's shown here on the left. It's all computer-based. You just throw in a bunch of sequences for different organisms, and the computer will make this tree for you. Now, each node is a common ancestor, so the nodes are these circles. So each circle here is a common ancestor, and I believe the numbers mean like on average how many amino acids are different, right? And so if you want to compare like the snapping turtle to the carp, on average you have four plus three plus two plus four. So roughly you should expect 13 amino acids to be different. If you're just looking at uh, cytochrome C, uh, a homologous protein, proteins that appear in different organisms, but they do the same thing. Um, so that's just one way we can look at evolution through proteins. What are the requirements to be a conservative mutation? A conservative mutation just means if you look at a, the same protein in different organisms, that, that ami a certain amino acid position never changes as a plane goes by here. Um, so if I, if I compared the sequences of like 100 cytochrome Cs from different organisms, and at position 10, there was always a lysine, then we would say this is, um, this is like invariable. While a conservative protein would be, if I looked at 100 proteins and at position 15, and I'm just making up positions, if it went like K, K, R, K, R, R, if they're all positive, that's conservative. So the requirement is when I look at different species, the same protein, at a specific part in that protein, if I always see the same characteristic of amino acid, but the amino acid itself is different, that's a conservative mutation. So if I'm seeing like A, L, I, V, L, I, I, all of these amino acids are hydrophobic. And so that spot needs a hydrophobic amino acid. So that's conservative. 
as a conservative mutation. Remember, and, and don't forget, when, we're, when I'm talking about positions, I'm talking about comparing different organisms, right? I'm looking at the same protein in different organisms and, and looking at their sequences. So let's just get the idea of how you might do a phylogenetic tree. So here I have uh, three proteins. I just call them protein A, B, and C. Here I give you um, some amino acids for that proteins. So this is the same protein from three different organisms. So organism A, organism B, organism C. So let's see, based on that information, if you could sketch me a phylogenetic tree for how these organisms are related based on this one protein. All right, I think all the planes are now passed. So what I did is I just looked at the positions in my proteins, my three proteins, and asked, is the amino acid the same or is it different? Um, and you can see there are four spots, four amino acid positions that are different in our proteins. And when we do this, we would see that actually in protein A and C, they are the same in three of those positions. And it's protein B that's always changing, except for uh, this row where they're all different. So if we just look at these proteins to determine how these different organisms are related, A oops, and C had an ancestor more in common than they did with B. So A and C would be at a close, their node would be closer then would be the node comparing them to B. So the common ancestor split off here to make B, then went on, and then we have another split point between A and C. Any questions about phylogenetic trees and uh, protein evolution when looking at amino acids? Not we can move on. And so when we talk about protein evolutions um, and we look at a lot of different um, organisms that have the same protein in them, we can learn some interesting things. One thing is this idea of a domain. Now a domain is a conserved sequence of roughly 400 to 200 residues. And basically a domain has the same structure, even though the sequence might be different. Um, maybe an analogy to this would be um, a steering wheel in a car. If you look at cars or you look at trucks, the steering wheel is basically the same. They might be made out of different material. They might be like different like leather, colors, different woods, different metals, what have you. But 
they all look the same and they all have the same function. They steer the car. A domain in a protein is kind of the same idea where they all look the same. And then if they have about over 40% of the same sequence, you can say these domains probably do the same thing in these different proteins. If the domain just looks the same and the sequence is less than 25% the same, they could be doing different things in, in, the, um, in the protein. So that's basically what a domain is. Domain is just a part of the protein, a section of the protein, where it looks the same in other proteins. Then based on the sequence similarity, how close are my amino acids, you can start to say, do these have the same function or not? Um, so there was a question, let me just take a second, a uh, question based on the previous problem. So we find the similarities and differences and connect dots to see the common ancestor. Yeah, that's basically what's going on, uh, where the less differences you have, the closer the common ancestor was. Now, talking more about protein evolution, we have some more vocab. We have orthologs. An ortholog is just a homologous protein with the same function in different species. So it's you find two proteins inside of a species and they do the same thing, or sorry, in different species, but they do the same thing. You would say these proteins are, are orthologs of each other. If you find two different proteins in the same species that are doing the same thing, we call that a gene duplication. That's usually how um, evolution happens for proteins. Usually in populations of organisms, you get a gene duplication event where uh, for some reason, your DNA is just copied again. And now you will make two different proteins that do the same thing. And for the organism, so protein A and protein B, as long as one copy of that protein works, then you're alive. So what could happen is that protein A might not mutate, but then you'll have mutations in protein B. And let's say over a couple million years, um, after enough mutations, protein B might have a new function. It just might mutate and mutate and mutate until, ta-da, now I can do something new. And maybe that organism can now eat a new food source, what have you. But that is how proteins can evolute, uh, evolve inside of a species. You can have these gene duplication events. You make double the amount of one type of protein. One protein is free to mutate. Now, what we can do, what's interesting is this chart on the right, the way to read this chart is on the y-axis is the amount of amino acid mutations per 100 sites. So how often do we mutate every 100 sites, right? And on the x-axis, we're just looking at how many millions of years it's been since, you know, we have diverged. We have created like new organisms that have new copies of these proteins. And what we'll see is that certain proteins like uh, fibro, uh, fibronopeptides, for the, sorry, I can't talk, fibrinopeptides will change all the time. They have a ton of mutations when you look at different organisms. Well, something like a histone, over a billion years, histone H4 is like not changed. No matter what organism you look at, histone H4 is basically the same, no matter what you carry out, you're looking at, this no H4 is gonna be the same. So that brings us to our question. Thinking about evolution in the big picture, why would histones not change over like a billion years? Why would histones remain the same? And if you're unaware, a histone wraps DNA, remember. So why would my histones never change?
Yeah, got it in one. So DNA never changes, right? DNA is the same no matter what organism you look at. You look at any organism on Earth. DNA is phosphate backbone, that's negatively charged, sugar, and base. All DNA is like that. So all DNA is the same molecule throughout however long you want to talk about. DNA doesn't like change. So why would a protein whose sole job it is to wrap DNA change? It wouldn't because the thing it's wrapping doesn't change. So any mutation, basically the histone, would decrease its ability to wrap DNA. If you can't wrap DNA properly, you can't make your DNA compact, your cell's not gonna be able to live. If your cell is not gonna be able to live, you can't pass on your DNA and you die. So histones, since they interact with a molecule that never changes, they themselves will probably never change. And we see that looking at mutation histories. So here's another big picture question for you then. What's the point of domains? Why is that good? Why are domains a thing? If they weren't good, we wouldn't see them, right? So why, why, why is that advantageous for organisms to have these protein domains? Think about it like having some of the work done already. Yeah, that's one way to put it for sure. Um, so domains, right? It's like a pre-assembled part that's ready to go already. Um, this is gonna be a weird example, but I've been putting together a lot of Ikea furniture over the last three weeks because we just moved into a house in August. So. Let's say I wanted to build a table, right? One way I could do it is I could go chop down a tree and then from that tree, I could like form a leg and form a base. And then I could go and get like, and drill holes in it and all that. Or I could buy pre-assembled leg or legs that are already made. A pre-assembled base or just a flat top or whatever, and then put the legs onto the base and look, I got a table. So the idea is a domain is already a pre-assembled part that has some function, right? Yeah, if they need to have a base function that they need to have, why would you keep making it over and over again? Yeah, exactly. Why reinvent the wheel? If I have a specific like domain that will do something like, this will break down glucose or this will put a phosphate onto something. And I want another protein that will put a phosphate onto something. Wouldn't it just be more advantageous if this domain just kind of went copy to itself and went to a new protein? And that's one way proteins can evolve too, is that they can acquire domains through maybe like a gene uh, replication event where there was a mismatch, there was a problem in replicating your DNA. It got this new uh, domain DNA. Now it's attached to this new domain. I have a new function. I can do something new that no other protein's done before. Um, so that's, that's the idea there. And that question is really to make sure you understand what a domain is. That's what I'm trying to get there. Do you know what a domain means when it comes to proteins? So yeah, very good. Um, if you have questions about that, uh, let me know. Now, we did have an activity here to show you Uniprot, Cluster Omega, ask you a bunch of questions. I line up a sequence. We're going to skip that. Um, it's just harping on the same ideas of looking at uh, a real world example of um, protein evolution, which is cool. Um, but I'm going to move on to the uh, next PowerPoint right now.
So let me pull up Friday's PowerPoint. It is 9.25, yes. Okay. So we've talked about primary structure already. Primary structure is just your list of amino acids, N terminus to C terminus. The next type of structure we're going to talk about is called secondary structure. Secondary structure is localized structure. It's basically, if I take my primary sequence, what local structures will they make? And for secondary structures, we usually talk about alpha helixes and what are known as beta sheets. So for the most part, when people say secondary structure, they're talking about alpha helixes and beta sheets. It's the local backbone confirmation of your proteins. That's another way to do it to say it rather. So this, this slideshow is all about secondary structure. So to really talk about secondary structure, we need to understand the chemistry of the protein backbone, right? So in all of our drawings so far, we have always drawn the backbone like this, C double bond O and H. But there is a resonance structure. This, this um, form of the peptide backbone exists like 70 to 80% of the time. The other, I guess I should write it this way, the other 20 to 30% is this resonance structure where you have C double bond N. Now, if you remember from organic chemistry, you cannot rotate around a double bond. Double bonds are fixed because you have pi bonding. If you try to rotate around a double bond, you break your pi bonds, you have broken the bond, so you cannot rotate around a double bond. What that means is that the peptide bond, you do not rotate at all, and you form this, what's called a plane, right? So you form what's called the amide plane. Basically, if you look at C alpha of, a, of one amino acid and C alpha of another amino acid, it forms a plane. And based on the geometry of that plane, you get uh, different secondary structures. I know that's all, I'm sure, very confusing. Um, but let, let's break it down. When it comes to secondary structures, there are two angles we care about. One's called a phi angle, so we use the Greek phi, and one's called a psi angle. We use the Greek psi to talk about that. When we look at these, um, these different uh, uh, secondary structures, the phi angle is carbonyl carbon of amino acid one, amide, amide nitrogen of amino acid two, carbon alpha of amino acid two, carbonyl carbon of amino acid two. The psi, uh, amide nitrogen of uh, amino acid two, carbon alpha of amino acid two, carbonyl carbon amino acid two, amide nitrogen of amino acid three. And what we're rotating, what we're rotating about, what we're looking at, what we're measuring is called a dihedral angle. Now this model kit thing is, usually, is really just a reminder for me. So I need to get out of PowerPoint. And now you can look at my giant face again. So what is a dihedral angle? I'm gonna use two pens to demonstrate this, all right? So our system is, the white part of this pen is one atom. The point, the black part, is another atom. This pen, the point, is our third atom. The top of this pen, this point, is our fourth atom. So how a dihedral angle works. 
you take four atoms. So I'm going to call these atoms one, two, three, and four. Okay, atom one, atom two, atom atom three, and atom four. And you line up atom two and three. So you're looking, so they're, they're, they're lined up perfectly. And a dihedral angle is, you measure the angle between atom one and four at the extremes. So since the pens are perfectly lined up right now, I have a dihedral angle of zero. When I do this, the white part of the pen, one of my atoms, and the top of this pen are now separated by a 90 degree angle. This is a dihedral of 90. If I go all the way around, so they're completely up like this, this is 180 degrees. If I go here, that's 270. This is 360. So in normal angles where you only have three points, you only go from zero to 180. A dihedral, you can go from zero to 360. So 90 and 180 are not the same thing. They are different angles. They have different types of interactions. But all you're doing is you have four atoms the middle two are lined up perfectly, and you're just seeing, compared to atom one and atom four, what angle do they make? Do people have questions about that? I know the idea of a dihedral is kind of weird. I, I understand, so. But it has to do with secondary structure. So was that somewhat clear at least? I hope, maybe. Yes, no, maybe so. Zero and 360 are the same, yes. Here's zero, here's 360, right? So I guess technically you go from zero to 359.999 repeating. It's easier to say zero to 360, but yeah, that's 90, that's 270, that's 360 or zero. That's 180, 135, one, no, 85, something like that. Yeah. So we'll be talking about dihedrals for phi and psi angles because why that's important is because certain phi and psi um, angle combinations will tell us if we're in an alpha helix or a beta sheet, all right? Now, just talking about the peptide bond a little bit, what I'm showing you here is the cis conformation, where we have the oxygen, or sorry, we have the side chain. Let me get my pen out. You can't see my mouse probably. Where we have side chain of amino acid one and side chain of amino acid two, they're pointing in different directions, right? Um, so that's actually trans, right? That's the trans conformation. The cis conformation, is when they are pointing in the same direction. That's energetically unfavorable. Who can tell me why having my amino acids in a cis peptide bond is energetically unfavorable? Steric hindrance, yep. So this has sterics, this has sterics. When they're in cis, they are seeing each other, they don't want to be near each other. The only amino acid that can be in cis is proline. 10% of prolines can be in cis. And that's because its side chain actually goes away from it and will rebind to its nitrogen. So there's really not as much steric hindrance as there, are, as there is for other amino acids. So all of your amino acids are going to be in a trans peptide bond. Proline, 10% of the time, it will be in a cis peptide bond. Questions about that idea?
So why can't why, so why can it be cis? Because the side chain um, kind of like um, bonds away from the other amino acid. So if this is amino acid one, this is amino acid two, the side chain goes up and then away. And so by binding on its own backbone, it's not as sterically hindered for it to be in the cis. There is still some steric hindrances and it is less energetically favorable than proline being in trans, but it's not so energetically bad that it can't happen. The other amino acids do have too much of a steric hindrance that it won't happen. It's just energetically more or less impossible. Proline, 10% of the time, it will happen. When is proline and it's trans? Um, so most of the time it's trans, like 9% of the time, right? So for certain proteins, there's actually an enzyme that will um, change it. So I can't say like with certainty when it's gonna be in trans, when it's gonna be in, in, in cis. It depends, it's on a protein to protein basis, right? If a lot of the times, if you'll see, and we'll talk about this with beta sheets, a lot of times if there's a tight turn like this, there will be a proline in here and proline will be in the cis form. So it can make this uh, a protein like have a tight U-turn, right? Other times it'll be in cis just to help with some function, right? Um, proline is unique in that it can make the backbone into a cis. Um, um, peptide bond. And a lot of the times that has to do with function, but I can't make a blanket statement of it's always going to be cis here, or it's always going to be trans here. That's really, you have to study every single protein and make, make an observation at that point of why, why it is. But one of the more common reasons why it would be in cis rather than trans is to make tight turns. When it's in cis, the backbone can make a, a nice tight U-turn. Right. So let's look at our first secondary structure, the alpha helix, all right? And before I actually talk about the alpha helix, let's see what this chart is. This chart is called a Ramachandran plot. Um, I'm probably gonna misspell his name, Ram, Rama Chandran. Probably not, it's close, but that's probably not actually how you spell it. But what is, oh, it's at the top there. So, sorry, ignore my bad spelling. It's a Raman Chandran plot where you plot phi versus psi. All right, you are plotting phi angles versus psi angles. So, throughout your protein, you just see, what are my phi and psi combinations? Certain combinations will tell you about um, secondary structure motifs. So if you have a lot of phi and psi combinations that fall in this region, you would say with confidence, oh, my protein's an alpha helix there. While if you're up here in these two circles, you would say you're in a beta sheet. Here is another type of alpha helix. So this is a left-handed helix. This is a right-handed helix. The C stands for collagen. So collagen has its own specific terms, all right? But a Raman Chandran plot simply tells you what are the phi and psi angles in my protein. Based on those angles, you can determine whether you have second, whether you have alpha helixes or beta sheets. So let's look in, in these pictures down here. Sorry, I should explain all my pictures. These pictures are work that I've done. Yay, this is actually my research when I was a student where you look at all the glycines versus every single other amino acid and you make a Ramachandran plot. You look at the prolines, look at all the other amino acids compared to it and you make a Ramachandran plot. 
what you see is that proline is very restricted. Glycine can basically be at any part of the Ramachandra map. Blue is impossible. Red is highly likely, and it's just a color scale. You don't have to memorize um, like that, but it's just cool that I can actually show something from my working lecture. All right, alpha helix. So what an alpha helix is, it's your protein backbone forming a ribbon. And the way that this is held together is through hydrogen bonds. Like I said at the beginning of the class, if you don't know an answer, just say hydrogen bonds. That's, that's gonna be your best guess. So here, our backbone hydrogen bonds are holding our ribbon together. And it's the N plus fourth residue. So what that means is that residue one is hydrogen bonded to residue five in alpha helix, two with six, three with seven, so on and so forth. Every single turn, there's 3.4 residues. The side chains, they point outwards and they point down from the helix, right? So they're pointing out and down. Now let's, let's, I have some questions here so we can better understand the geometry of the alpha helix. So if I have an alpha helix, or rather, why would it be unlikely to have an alpha helix that only has arginine, lysine, met, phi, trip, tyrosine, and valine? If I tried to make these into an alpha helix, that would like never happen. Based on what I said above, why would I not make an alpha helix just using these amino acids? Large side chains. So it is large side chains. That's all they have in common. Take that the next logical step, right? Why are large side chains bad in an alpha helix? Take that, take that thought one step further. And it's a concept we just talked about in the previous slide too, with cis and trans peptide bonds. Steric hindrance, yes. So all of these amino acids are all these side chains are pointing out and down. That means everybody is interacting with their neighbors, right? So if you have huge bulky side chains like of the amino acids I listed here, they're gonna be hitting each other. They're gonna cause steric hindrance. They don't wanna be that close to each other. So one way not to be close is not to be in an alpha helix. So um, you're not gonna see big amino acids over and over and over again. You can see a couple, right? A couple can fit in, but if you have nothing but big side chains, that causes a lot of steric hindrance. All right, proline. I can have proline at the end terminus of an alpha helix, but any other part of an alpha helix, I cannot have a, pro, a proline. Proline is called a uh, structure breaker, secondary structure breaker. That's what proline is. So based on the structure of proline, why can proline not be in any part of the alpha helix except the N terminus? Is it because it folds on itself? Yes. Again, take that one step further. What does folding on itself have to do with being in an alpha helix? That is the correct answer, but expand on why that's correct, I guess. Explain why it's correct. And the answer here is not steric endurance. It might play a part in it actually, but that's not actually the reason why.
So here's a hint. What force holds together an alpha helix? What interaction holds together an alpha helix? Hydrogen bonds, yes. Hydrogen bonds hold together an alpha helix. Hydrogen bonds between what groups? What groups are hydrogen bonding? Is it the side chain or is it the backbone? It's the backbone. It's the amide hydrogen, hydrogen bonding with carbonyl carbons. Proline, proline binds on itself. If you remember, when proline binds on itself, it loses a hydrogen from the amide. And so what happens in a, in a pep protein backbone, proline does not have any hydrogens. There are no hydrogens on the nitrogen of proline. If there's no nitrogens, you can't hydrogen bond in an alpha helix because that is what's hydrogen bonding. That's being the case, proline can't be an alpha helix, except at the very beginning, because at the very beginning, the first residue, here's residue one, it's hydrogen bonding through a carbonyl carbon, which proline does have. So it can only be at the very first position, it cannot be at any other positions. And then C, which polypeptide is most likely to form an alpha helix? Um, I'll just go through this quickly. What you're looking for is, does your sequence have a proline? If so, will not form. So two will not form. Also, glycine. Glycine cannot be in an alpha helix because it's too flexible. When you're in an alpha helix, your position, your fine psi angle positions are fixed. Your fine psi angles do not change in an alpha helix. Glycine has so much freedom to restrict it in the alpha helix is energetically bad. Glycine does not want to be fixed to one fine psi combination. So, Glycine and proline are both called secondary structure breakers. So the answer is uh, three. It does have a glycine, but it's at the end. So that's okay. But it doesn't have any in the middle. It doesn't have a G or a P. So yes, if you see glycine and proline in a sequence, you know that that part of the sequence won't be in the alpha helix. Proline, because it does not have a hydrogen to bond to. Glycine, because there's too much entropy. There's too much freedom of movement. Glycine is the wild child. It's the roamer. If you try to make glycine stay at home and try to have one fine side angle, glycine's not happy. Glycine needs to be flexible. So glycine could probably be at the beginning too, just because there's more flexibility or the end, but it can't be in the middle. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's really what secondary uh, structure breaker is, is if it's in the middle, it will break the whole secondary structure. If I try to put a glycine right here, my whole alpha helix would unwind because it's energetically unfavorable to have glycine that restricted. One is not possible because you have glycine right in the middle. So this would not form an alpha helix. It, the, the answer is three because glycine's at the end. So that's acceptable for glycine to be get, at the beginning and the end because the alpha helix has more movement at the beginning or at the end. Two has a proline right in the middle and a glycine. One has a glycine. So the answer is more or less three. And like I said, what you're looking for 
Is there a gly glycine or a proline in the middle of my sequence? If so, bad. If there's not, then good. There are other things you have to think about, like is it just bulky amino acids? If so, bad. Um, but, you know, just having this sequence of all big amino acids is super rare, so. All right, I have gone over my time again. I'm getting bad at that. But that's all we have for today. Um, I'll put a homework up. It'll probably, like always, be up at four. I have another meeting to go to. But otherwise, if you have any questions about any material, never hesitate to email me. Never hesitate to um, set up a meeting with me. Never think you're wasting my time, please. Um, use as much time of mine that you want. This is my job, so I'm here to help you. Otherwise, hope you have a nice relaxing weekend now that that test is out of the way. Uh, take at least one day to enjoy yourself, right? One day to just relax if you can. I know not everyone can. But otherwise, I will see you hopefully on Monday. Take care, everybody.